Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Uh, again, we're now looking at the issue of being living sacrifices. And of course, verses 1 and 2 serve and form the foundation upon which we can ever serve uh, as living sacrifices. And it has everything to do with this transformation that occurs by the renewing of our minds. We've said some things regarding that. And by the way, again, reasonable service is when we, with deliberate, well thought out purpose, apply the doctrines that are learned. Listen, serving God as living sacrifices, reasonable service, isn't something that springs from the realm of our emotion, from sentiment, from feeling. It has everything to do with learning the doctrine, learning the truth, and allowing the truth to, uh, to change the, the inner man. And when it comes to the practicalities of life, when it comes to Christian experience, it has everything to do with the outward manifestation of an inward reality. Now, to reasonably serve, of course, verses 1 and 2, uh, focus in on how we reasonably serve the Lord, how we reasonably serve God, all right? Verses 3 down all the way to verse 16 deals with how we reasonably serve one another as members of the church, the body of Christ. Verses 3, and, by the way, and we know that because verse 3, if you recall, let's read verse 3 real quickly. For I say through the grace given unto me, not uh, to every man not, that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Now look at verse 16. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. So we have these bookends, if you will. Verse 3 uh, challenges the believer to not operate in high-mindedness. And of course, verse 16 sort of summarizes and reiterates uh, that uh, issue of not being high-minded. So verse 3 and verse 16 serve as bookends. Everything in between has to do with how we relate one to another. Now, verses three and uh, five, verses three through five, I'm sorry, deal specifically with the design of the church, the body of Christ. We are members one of another. And that really is a glorious truth. Yes, we are joined into living, loving, everlasting union with the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. But by default, we are also joined one with each other. We are members of this one body. So verse 3 through verse uh, 5 deal with this glorious design, uh, the body, uh, which is, of course, the church, the body of Christ. Verses 6 through verse 8 deal with our labor. It deals with how it is we serve together, okay? So if verses 3 through 5 deal with this identity that exists as members of one body, verses 6 through 8 deal with the issue of how it is we serve one another, how it is we labor together. We're now going to look at this final area in light of reasonably serving one another, which is now covering verses 9 through 16. And here we're really looking at the issue of our life together, okay? So the identity that we have as members of one body, that's our positional reality. We then have to learn something about how it is we serve and how it is we labor uh, for one another amongst uh, the assembly. Verses 9 now is going to focus on body life, how it is we relate with each other, how it is we actually uh, live life together, okay? 
And it's not complicated. There's no reason, and I don't really intend to go through these verses exhaustively and break it down and dissect it. Um, you know, the Lord deliberately issues these very quick, straightforward instructions, okay? And, and they're not, it, it's meant to be simple. We don't need to overcomplicate anything. But what we certainly do want to recognize is our life together, the way we are to relate with each other, has everything to do with verses 9 and 10, verse 9 especially. Look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. In verse 10, notice, we have uh, reemphasized the issue of love. Verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. So uh, these instructions, these very quick, uh, straightforward instructions are built upon, are held together, is energized, and, and empowers because of love. Our life together is built upon this issue of love. Our relationship with each other is glued, it's, it's held together by love. We're empowered, we're strengthened, we're sustained, we're energized, we're driven, we're compelled because of this issue of love, okay? And uh, we're never going to really understand uh, verses 9 through 16 unless we have a real proper understanding of this foundational truth. Verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. So let's talk about love which is without dissimulation. And then we're going to look at verse 10. Well, what exactly is brotherly love? What, is, what does it mean to be kindly affectioned one to another? Dissimulation. It's the dictionary definition, pretty simple. Dissimulation, according to the dictionary, simply means to pretend or to disguise. It means it's not real, it's not genuine, okay? And certainly there's truth to that. Uh, you see the word dissimilar, similitude, simulation. Um, you're not truly resembling, you're not truly reflecting, you're not truly exemplifying the genuine, real deal, okay? So the idea of let love being without dissimulation, listen, the challenge and the exhortation is the type of love that the Lord exhorts the believer to express is a genuine love, but it isn't love as defined and measured by the world. We've said this a million times. Worldly love all too often is built upon mere sentiment. It's built upon uh, the, the emotional realm. It's built upon, you know, this reciprocating relationship. Hey, I'll love you if you love me. I'll do good to you if you're doing good to me. Now, what's the problem with that type of reciprocating relationship? What happens if you do me wrong? What happens if you do me evil? What happens if you offend me? You see, true love, divine love, and that's what Paul's talking about. Real love resembles the love that God has for us. True, genuine love has everything to do with reflecting and resembling the degree and the measure by which God values each and every one of us. And it has nothing to do with how worthy the recipient is. And that's what makes the love of God just absolutely marvelous. And by the way, we, you know, 1 John, God is love. And it isn't just, again, this touchy-feely, warm, you know, sentiment that God has. Uh, love is an act of the will. Love is a mental attitude. Love is a choice. And we're going to find out love uh, is intelligent. Now remember verse 2, this, uh, verse 1 again. Just glance back up to verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, critically important, 
It isn't reasonable because it only makes sense. The only logical conclusion that one can come to, it's reasonable in the sense that real service is based upon well thought out, deliberate, purposeful thinking. It's the way we view things. It's the way we perceive things. It's literally living out the same value system that God himself possesses. How is it that God sees each and every one of us? How is it that God treats each and every one of us? What perspective, what viewpoint consumes our Lord when it comes to the individual members of the body? You know what we now are privileged to do? Resemble that. Not, not, not this outward, fake, counterfeit type of love, but to be without dissimulation. It's truly the work of the inner man. It's this inward reality which is literally expressing itself out. Okay? The word dissimulation. I'm making a big deal out of the word dissimulation, aren't I? Go to Galatians chapter 2. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Uh, just so that we understand. Well, wait a minute. How can love be fake? You see, if Paul says, let love be without dissimulation, is it possible to love with dissimulation? So what exactly does that mean? Uh, it, go to Galatians chapter 2, and here's a great illustration. The only other time we find the word dissimulation is in Galatians chapter 2. And notice how the word is used. By recognizing how the word dissimulation is used here in Galatians 2, it's going to help us understand how it is our love should be without it. Okay? In Galatians chapter 2, let's just look at how the word is used, and then we'll look at the context real briefly. But notice in Galatians 2, verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their, now there's the word, dissimulation. Now, what's happening in the context? If you go to verse 11, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Now, this is Paul the Apostle, the Apostle of the Gentiles, who um, Paul's a little bit hot under the collar, okay? And when he says, I withstood him to the face, Paul is saying, Peter was to be blamed. Did Peter make a mistake? I mean, did Peter do something wrong? Well, obviously, yes. Why else would Paul now confront him in public and ascribe blame to Peter? So verse 11, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Well, what did he do? Poor Peter, verse 12. For before that, certain came from James... Now, understand something about James. James was zealous of the law. He was a law-abiding Jew who was a principal leader among the Jewish church, which is at Jerusalem. And you can go to Acts 21 and you can read about that. So James is a real principal figure here in relationship to the Jewish church. Okay? So in, now that's why his name is brought up. Verse 12, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. You know what that, remember Peter's understanding of the Gentiles before Paul. Before the apostle Paul visits Jerusalem and actually sits down with Peter and the other apostles, before that time, what was Peter's understanding in light of the Gentiles? How did Peter view Gentiles? According to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, Peter viewed the Gentiles as unclean. So it's quite clear that Peter, Peter wasn't derelict. Peter was not unfaithful. Now, there are some slanderous accusations that are hurled against Peter when Peter refused to go to Cornelius' house. He refused to go to the Gentiles. And then he had the audacity to say they are unclean. Where did Peter get the idea that Gentiles were unclean? He got it on, from the law. 
He got it right from the book of Exodus. God is the one who created a middle wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentile. God is the one who erected this wall which separated Israel from all the nations of the world in order for Israel to be protected and immune from the corrupt corruptive taint and the corruptive influence of the Gentiles. God said to Israel, I am not going to number you, Israel, among the Gentiles. So Israel's understanding of the Gentile was they were unclean. That explains why Peter, in Acts chapter 10, refused to go to the house of a Gentile. Peter was faithful. Even Jesus reaffirmed the reality that there's a distinction between Jew and Gentile. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? Enter ye not into the way of who? The Gentiles. Even Jesus Christ, he reaffirms this distinction between Jew and Gentile. So, before James showed up, Peter ate with the Gentiles. Now, why in verse 12, when it says, before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Why did Peter begin to eat with Gentiles when in Acts chapter 10, he refused to go to the Gentiles? He called them unclean. A tremendous change happened in history. The change that happened regarding the status of the Gentile. The Gentiles were unclean. Obviously, in Acts chapter 10, the Lord says, don't you call them unclean anymore. Something happened in human history. What Paul is describing in Galatians chapter 2, go to verse 2, Galatians 2 verse 2, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the who? The Gentiles. Listen, Paul, as the apostle of the Gentiles, was entrusted with a very specific set of good news. And you know what the good news is regarding Gentiles? Does God view Gentiles as unclean anymore? Not at all. You know what the good news is? That through the fall and casting away and death, the functional death of the nation of Israel, God Almighty now views Gentiles as accepted. He's reconciled the world unto himself. And so what Paul is told to do by revelation, Jesus Christ says, you're going to go up there to Jerusalem. Verse 2, and I went by revelation. The Lord Jesus said, you're going to go, Paul and communicate unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. You study Acts chapter 15. So Paul now sits down with Peter, and he begins to provide the details regarding this message and ministry that was given to the Apostle Paul. So Peter now learns, and it's now confirmed in Acts chapter 15, that Gentiles are what? Clean or unclean? They're clean. God has changed the dispensational program by which he was operating for 1,500 years. Gentiles are unclean. You don't go to the Gentiles. They are separated. They are on the other side of the wall. And for the first time in human history, after the call, commissioning, conversion of the Apostle Paul, God now declares, you do not call Gentiles unclean. They are now separated. I now have reconciled the world to myself, and they are now accepted and sanctified by God the Holy Ghost. So guess what Peter now does? Does he have a problem eating with Gentiles? Not since he was told and taught about this dispensational change. But what happened? All of a sudden, James, that law-abiding zealot, and the men that were associated with James. They came into town, okay, into Antioch. Verse 12 of chapter 2. And for before that, certain men from James, uh, certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles. No problem. He was educated. He was brought up to a proper dispensational understanding. What is God doing today? Now keep reading. But when they were come, he withdrew 
and separated himself. What did Peter just do? Did Peter know that Gentiles are no longer unclean? Did, he understands it. That's why he's eating with Gentiles. But now because of intimidation from this group, he separated himself from who? From the Gentiles. Fearing them which were of the circumcision. So wait a minute. What is the truth regarding Gentiles? They're clean. They're accepted. They've been reconciled. But in practice, in behavior, in action, what did Peter do? He viewed the Gentile, he, he, he treated the Gentiles as though they were still what? Unclean. Are they unclean? No. But his behavior violated his understanding. Let me put it this way. His action did not resemble, it did not reflect the truth. His behavior, his action, his perspective of the Gentiles did not reflect what he knew to be true about the Gentiles. He violated his own understanding. Was he not taught? Gentiles are clean. And what did he do? He treated them as though they were unclean. Now look at verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their, here we go, dissimulation. Dissimulation really simply means when one's behavior and action does not resemble or reflect the reality. It doesn't resemble what is true. It does not resemble what they know to be reality. The reality is they're clean, they're accepted. Their behavior, we call it hypocrisy. God has declared Gentiles to be clean, but I can't eat with them because my behavior resembles my, in this case, fear of outside influences, his behavior resembled a lie. His behavior reflected a lie. Dissimulation means you're not treating people the way God tells us to treat people. This is a, a real simple illustration of what dissimulation means is he knew better and chose not to live it. So when Paul uses that word, let love be without dissimulation, it simply means that our love is based upon the truth. In fact, look at verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the what? gospel. You know how we're supposed to love one another? Not based upon what you think, not based upon our conceited sense of superiority and high-mindedness. You know how we're supposed to love? Based upon what God tells us about one another. Listen, uh, you know, Lexi might be a real jerk to me, and he's yet to be a jerk to me anyway. He may be a jerk. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you know, if my response if my reaction to Lexi is, I don't get mad, I get even. If it's, you know what, tick for tat. If you know what, you treat me bad, I'm going to treat you wrong. My, if I'm going to love him with the same level and measure that God loves him, it doesn't matter what he does to me. I have to view Lexi based upon what the Lord tells me about Lexi. Okay? Dissimulation means I'm going to violate what the Lord tells me about each and every one of you. I don't care what the Lord says. If the Lord says He loves you and you're forgiven and you're accepted and you're blessed and you're complete and you're clean and you're beloved... 
to love you with dissimulation basically means I don't care what the Lord says, what he says about you. I'm going to respond based upon your treatment of me. And by the way, in the context, that's what the evil Paul's talking about. That's evil. That is evil. A couple of words, a couple of synonyms, if you will. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, Paul uh, says it. Uh, slightly differently in, in a couple of other passages, but it conveys, it carries the same weight of meaning in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You see, to love without dissimulation, it has every, the real, genuine love that Paul, that the passage is uh, talking about, is loving one another based upon the value system that God operates upon, Okay? Now, that, that, that's what true, genuine love is. Viewing, honoring, valuing one another as the worthy, beloved of Almighty God, irrespective, regardless of your behavior towards me. That's, that's high ground. I understand that. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. 2 Corinthians 6, 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost. Now, notice how Paul says it. By love, notice how he says it, unfeigned. You know what it, you know what it means when somebody feigns something? You're fake. You're pretending. But real love, in, 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 as far as the Apostle Paul's concerned, unfeigned love means I'm going to love you according to the measure by which God loves you. That's genuine love. Not based upon how much love I can muster up in the realm of my own flesh. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you. No, no, that's, that, that's unfeigned. That's dissimulation. Genuine love says, if God places that much value upon you, even though your behavior might not reflect it, I now have a duty and a responsibility to honor you as much as God honors you, value you as much as God values you, esteem you as much as God esteems you. That's what true love is. Uh, another passage in this regard, go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and, and just notice how Peter, uh, as he is equipping the little flock, so forth, he uses similar language, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, notice there verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Uh, and we're going to come back to this passage in a few minutes. But for right now, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. Now notice, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Even Peter. Again, there, it's possible to fake it. It's possible that to feign love. But real love resembles God's love. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. And, and let's just look at, well, what exactly, then how does love resemble God's love? In Ephesians chapter 5, notice here in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Ephesians 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And of course, you understand the difference between being a follower and an imitator, right? To follow means I'm going to yield to, well, the one who's leading. To be a follower simply means I'm going to adopt what God is teaching me. Obviously, in chapter 4, well, chapters 1 through 4, there's a great deal of information. Notice in chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And there's a tremendous amount of doctrine from this point on. So, in light of all of this information, chapter 5, verse 1, be ye therefore what? Followers of God. Let God take the lead in the way you think, in the way you perceive. But notice what Paul says. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. You know what it means to be dear? 
the, the admonition here is a, a dear child is, is one who is viewed as the object of fondness. In other words, to be the dear children of God. We relate to one another with this sense of deep esteem and, and uh, deep fondness that God has for each and every one of us. We're dear to Him. We are the beloved. We are greatly valued. We are the first loved. We've said some things so, you know, when we first started in Romans chapter 1. Remember, we are the beloved of God. Be loved, the very object of God's love and honor and value. We are deeply valued by God. So, so we're supposed to follow God as the dear children that we are. Now, we got to understand, how much does God love you? He calls you dear. You are tremendous. He, he, he in, in one sense, he, he really doesn't want to live without you. Now, that's hard to believe. Can God live without you? He can. I mean, he did it in eternity past, did he not? But does God choose to enjoy all of eternity with you? You have to understand something about the character and nature of Almighty God. Why did God create? Why is God creating a new creature? Why is God saying what He says about you and about me? Why is it that God has chosen to love us with great love and to bestow upon us great mercy and the exceeding kindness of the riches of His grace? Why? Why does he make us accepted? Why are we beloved? Why are we blessed? Why are we complete in him? Why does he love me so much? Well, that's the type of God we have. He wants to spend eternity enjoying this glorious relationship as a father and as a son. And you know what makes grace so powerful? A motivation because God never says, thou shalt do anything anymore. As he just showers with us with this overabounding, exceeding richness of his grace and his kindness toward us, the only response left is for the son to say, you are my worthy father. Hence Romans 12:1. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that ye what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see that? Is, what kind of compulsion? Remember what Paul says? The love of Christ constrains. The only motive, pure, unadulterated response to God's grace is basically to agree you are a worthy father, worthy to be adored, worthy to be loved, and hence I present myself. See that? Total free will. Not because we're afraid of God anymore, not because we're trying to win the carrot, you know, trying to win the prize. It's simply responding to all that He has already graciously provided and given to us. So, if God says, I want you to follow me, just like a father as he educates his son, come on, follow me, join me, labor with me, participate in what I'm doing. You don't have to, son. And all too often, sons don't participate. But the challenge is, verse 1, be ye therefore. Come on, let's go ahead and let's join what dad is doing here, right? As dear children... We respond to the endearment. We respond to that deep affection and fondness and esteem that our Father holds in His heart. So what can we now do? Verse 2. And walk in what? Love. The more we see His deep love for us, you know what it begins to compel us? We now walk where? In love. That's our address. I don't know if there's a better way of saying this. Walk where? In love. That's where we live. 
That's our reality. That's our identity. That's our address. In, we walk, we operate, we move, we have our being, we progress in life. Where? In love, possessing that very value system that consumes the heart of Almighty God, so much so that He gave His only begotten Son, right? God commended His love towards who? Us. Did we merit that love? Did we do anything to instigate, to, to motivate God to love us. No, while we were yet sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were enemies, God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet what? There was nothing lovely about us. Think about that. God can love the unlovable and he loves the unlovely. That's each and every one of us in this room right here. Now that's, the, that's God's value system. It has nothing to do with what you did in life. It has nothing to do with what you hope to achieve in life. It has nothing to do with your capacities, your behavior, your religiosity. It has nothing to do while we were dead in trespasses and sins. What did God do? He loved us. He ascribed value and worth to the worthless and to the valueless because of who he is. That's his value system. And Christ died for us. And hence God says, I'll give you eternal life as a free gift, not by works of righteousness we, which we have done, but according to his mercy. We're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. God has completely cut us out of that picture when it comes to eternal life. Christ Jesus did it all for That's love. That's love. To value the helpless, to, to ascribe honor and esteem to the worthless, to the profitless, to those that hurt, to those that oppose, to those that are enemies, to those that seek to, 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 to stop. That's the love. So look at verse 2 again. And walk where? In love. Now look at the example. As Christ also hath loved us. And how did Christ love us? Give you a wonderful spouse, house, car, job. You know what I'm saying. You know, how, in the, how do we know how much God loves us? You know how much Christ loved us? He hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now, let that, let that just sort of sink in a little bit. Let love be without what? Dissimulate. Well, what is genuine love? Genuine love is to have the same mind that drove Jesus Christ to die as that all-sufficient propitiation, that sacrifice for who? Sinners. To, to, to lo for love to be without dissimulation. That is, it's the real deal love that Paul is talking about is in the exemplification. It is the active manifestation of this selfless, sacrificial value system that one has to the unworthy, to those that do not deserve it. But love chooses. Love is a mental act. Love says, I choose to do it. Even though my flesh and my emotions resist, but I choose to do it in spite of what I might feel about you. Now, you see in verse 2, this, this love, which is exemplified how? As Christ also gave himself how? As an offering and a what? Sacrifice. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Interesting, Paul's going to use the very same imagery. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great charity chapter, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, wait a minute. How in the world? I'm supposed to love you. I'm supposed to walk in love. My life is to be measured and, and consumed with this value system. 
valuing the lost like God values the lost. God loves the sinner, but he views the saint as beloved. That's interesting. God loves the sinner. He died for the sinner, right? But does he love the saint? He says, you're beloved. You know that as the, belie- as the children of God, we enjoy, if I can say it this way, a higher measure of love. God never calls the sinners the unsaved. He never calls lost people beloved. He says, I love them. You know, he reserves that label beloved only for his dear children. Greatly loved, first loved. There is a special love that God has for those of us who are his dear children. Okay? I'm supposed to walk like that. If God loves you that much, genuine love means I have to love you the same way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity... I am become as a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and I have not charity, I am nothing. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I, now look at this, though I give my body to be burned. Now that's strong language, right? Remember, walk in love as Christ also loved us. And how did he prove how much he loved us? He gave himself what? An offering and a sacrifice. Look at verse 3 again. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and, and though I give my body to be burned. Now, that is very strong language, but I hope you under, you see the imagery here. Is it? Have people burned at the stake? Have people died? Have people been giving o- given over as sacrifices? Yeah. Now Paul says, if I give my body to be burned, if I yield my body in sacrifice, and I don't have charity, you know what he says at the end of verse 3? It profiteth me nothing. There's no value to it. Now, wait a minute. What in the world is Paul talking about? Is it possible for people to die for a cause, a social cause? Is it possible for people to be martyred for some grand social principle or social cause? You see, yeah, it's possible. People have died for social causes, okay? People have burned at the stake in principle, I refuse to surrender my right to this, that, or that, and I will die. Paul says, you know what? If you don't have charity, it's meaningless. Well, well, wait a minute. In what way can someone die meaningfully? How does one die as an offering, as a sacrifice, charitably? You see, Paul's talking, how about dying in the stead or in place of someone else. You see, it's possible to give your body to be burned for some grand cause, some principle, as some sort of martyr. But it's also possible to give your body to be burned for someone else, in someone else's place. You see the difference there? Paul is emphasizing the need for charity. And in all of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul, he talks about charity, charity, charity. By the way, what is the difference between love and charity? Love is that mental attitude. Love is that value system, that way of measuring someone, that way of perceiving someone, seeing them as valuable, seeing them as worthy, seeing them as honorable. Charity puts on display By definition, charity means liberal benevolence. It means that strong compulsion and disposition to do good. Charity says, do something about it. Love says, I hold you in highest esteem. Paul actually says, preferring one another in honor. Who's the priority? You know what charity does? Charity says, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Charity says, I'm going to now exemplify it. I am now going to take that mental disposition, that mental awareness, that mental attitude, love of value, and now I'm going to put it to work. The 
inward reality is now outwardly on display. That's the difference between love and charity. What Paul's emphasizing here is, hey, listen, put it on display. Put it, put it, put it, demonstrate it, activate it. Don't just have the value system as all important as it is, but now respond to it. Put it to work. So Paul, when he's talking about sacrifice, the issue is not for your own advantage, not for your own benefit, but rather are you willing to sacrifice and to be an offering for someone else's benefit, for someone else's spiritual advantage. That's what true, genuine love is all about without dissimulation. You see, oh, I love you so much, brother. Well, real love is that type of divine love love that Paul said. Now, by the way, drop down to verse 13. Verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is what? Charity. Wow. Not, not Charity is the greatest, not at the expense of faith and hope. Don't, don't misunderstand what that verse is saying. It's not saying ignore faith and, and uh, ignore hope and just concentrate on charity. No. Faith, hope, charity, those three working in tandem, working in conjunction, working together, the greatest is charity. In what sense is charity the greatest? Not that faith and hope are inferior. It's the greatest because it takes the faith, which is motivated and sustained by hope, and guess what charity does? It steps out of our comfort zone, and it now activates that work of faith. It now is... Uh, uh, fortified with that hope that we have. Charity is the greatest because it now puts on open display what faith and hope is seeking to achieve. There's some verses. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And, and you know what? Then go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and then go to 1 Peter chapter 1, all right? 1 Timothy chapter 1, and then 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, look at what Paul writes to Timothy here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Notice verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is what? Charity. So think about that for a second. The end of the commandment, not the end as in cessation. But the end as in what? The goal. Okay? That means the word end can be used in different ways. Um, the finish line is the end of the race, right? Or the finish line is the goal. Okay? So the end of the command. What is the objective? By the way, what is the commandment? You know, it, it, beginning in verse 1, you notice in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by commandment of God, and then look there at verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Okay, what is the, what is the goal of the commandment? The commandment. There is specific doctrinal information that was given to Paul. And so Paul now is charging Timothy in verse 3. He says, listen, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Okay? Well, what's the goal? Why is, so, why is it critically important, number one, to recognize the apostleship of Paul and the curriculum entrusted to him called grace? And why is it so important to charge some that they don't teach any other doctrine? What is the purpose? Verse 5. Now the end of the commandment, the goal, the objective, is charity. You know what sound Bible doctrine is intended to ultimately achieve? Charity. I can give my body to be burned. Not for my own selfish agenda. Not for my own self cause it's possible to live as living sacrifices, offering up your life as an offering and a sweet-smelling savor for the benefit of someone else. That's real love. 
That's genuine love. Now, it is important to recognize, verse 5, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. That issue of charity out of a pure heart. Does, it mean, does that mean sinless heart? Pure. In the context, doctrinal purity. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice how Peter says it again. 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is my point. True love, in fact, true charity has to be intelligent. Not, not intelligent in the sense of high IQ. It has to be based upon doctrines learned. Listen, I do not naturally love you. Shock. But you don't naturally love me either. Can I choose to learn to love you? In fact, the more I learn about my love, the love that, that my Father has towards me, the more I learn about the tremendous love and value that God has for us as a, as a corporate entity, uh, can I learn to love you the way Christ loves you? That's exactly what the end of the commandment is. What's the point? Is learning the Bible simply so I can get an A-plus in heaven with a couple of gold stars? And a two-car garage, because I always want a two-car garage or a four-car garage. What is the intent of sound Bible doctrine? So that we are moved to live with a sense of sacrificial love. That's, that's the end of the commandment. The goal, charity. Out of a what? Pure heart. Now, Peter says something real similar. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls. How do you purify your soul? By confessing your sins? Do you purify your soul by avoiding evil? By, you know, uh, going to church? You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, this is how you purify yourself. Well, according to Peter, he's going to tell the, the audience, if you will, how do you purify your soul? Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the what? You know what the truth? The truth has this cleansing, sanitizing effect, but the washing of water by the what? The word. Now, remember Romans chapter twelve, when we're supposed to be transformed, right? Manifesting the real you, who we really are, from the realm of the inner man. Be you transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind, mind renewal. Okay. It's it, not brainwashing. Well, in one sense, you're, you're soul washing. You're cleansing all of the time past, fleshly oriented way of thinking and the value systems that we operated since birth. And there is a way in which we view people. And we're supposed to renew our thinking. We're supposed to wash, flush out that old way of thinking. That, that so easily resides, you see. And, and as we renew our mind, we take the doctrines learned, and there is this cleansing effect. There is this purifying. The truth purifies us from the taint of worldly wisdom or, or error. Verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto, again, unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart. Not again, not, 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 not quote a sinless heart, but rather a pure heart, learning how much God loves us and how much God loves your brother. And choosing to love your brother as deeply and as richly as God loves your brother. See, that's loving without dissimulation. That's genuine. It's real. It's sincere. Now, it's interesting that Peter goes on and he keeps talking about the word. He keeps talking about the word. Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the, notice, word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as the grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The gla uh, grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word. which we, You know what Peter is saying here? In light of loving the brethren with all fervency, that, you know, to be fervent. I mean, there is an intensity. 
We can intensely love someone, our brothers specifically. We love the brethren as intensely as God values us. And in the context, it's God's word. It's God's word. It's the truth that affects change in how we view one another and how we act and respond one to another. If we go over, for example, the First Thessalonians, go to First. Thess- I'll tell you what. Go to Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Philippians uh, chapter 1. And just some verses in light of, to love is to be taught. We, we got to learn to do this. It doesn't come naturally. I do not naturally have a desire to give my body to be burned for you. Naturally. But the end of the commandment is charity. Learning sound Bible doctrine is intended to adopt God's mentality and to be willing to do what Christ did. In in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more. How? In knowledge. This level of love, genuine love, it's taught we have to learn it. Go to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. Uh, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I, I said chapter 1. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And notice how Paul writes it here. 1 First, First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9. Verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. It's taught. We have, to, we have to take in that sound Bible doctrine so that we now can walk in love. We now can live charitably. We now can do, and, and for sake of time, we're going to close, go to, back to Philippians, go to Philippians chapter 2, and um, we're going to stop here. Love Without dissimulation, it really is resembling, and and we can resemble God's love. That's what the doctrine is intended to do, to resemble His love. And that's why, for example, Philippians chapter 2, verse verse 1, Philippians 2, verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, that word bowels, that is that deep-seated affection that develops at the core of our inner man. The the bowels and mercies. Verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's hard. It is against the natural man, the natural nature, the fleshly way of thinking. To esteem others better than myself? Verse 4, look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that's it. We got to let this way of thinking reside in our thinking. It's the choice we make. Now, we sort of introduced that issue of let love be without dissimulation. We'll, next Sunday, we'll look at some of the particulars, all right? Because now, from verses 10 through verse 16, you have these little quick, hey, you know, rejoice in hope. Hey, be patient in tribulation. Uh, you know, instant in prayer. All of a sudden, you have these little quick exhortations. And what those quick exhortations are doing is it's just putting on display that genuine love that we learn as we take in 
that sound Bible doctrine. Father, we do thank you once again for your great love that was uh, put on display there at Calvary's cross where Christ truly did offer himself up as that sweet-smelling savor for a, a needful, lost, dying world. We thank you, Lord, that we now, as dear children, can choose to follow you, uh, choose to, to think exactly the way you think about others, but um, especially in relationship to one another as brothers, uh, as sisters in Christ, as, as your household. May we learn how it is we're supposed to live and relate one to another with that sense of, uh, of sacrificial uh, uh, thinking. We do thank you, Father, that we, we can uh, learn to love one another as deeply and as intimately as you love us. And we, of course, pray these things.